I'm rifling through my shit. <laughs> I feel like we need elevator music. <laughs> There's the dogma notes. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. So... <clears throat> Hi, I'm John. I'm Andrew. And this is Agree to Disagree. And I'm trying to think of a good, like, stinger line for that where we s- s- summarize we what need a, we the need, show is. Like, we need a theme song. Yes, we do. Oh, my God. I'm, I, I'm working on that. I feel like we, we just need a theme song to close that out and then, like, bring us into the next points. And then I think we'll be fine. No, last night you sent me this message that got me really excited because <laughs> I was like, I thought you had found a theme song no, no, for no, us. No. I'm I like, just, oh, it's perfect. It's in Silver Surfer. This is great. And I then found I, our outro song, which is uh, which is <laughs> stage two, a rock, o, an OC remix from stage two of the Silver Surfer video game. Oh, yeah. NES. I don't know how in God's name I knew what that was. I, I heard that. I'm like, I know this from somewhere. Silver Surfer remains the best music I've ever heard come out of the NES. It is also a terrible game. It is a terrible game. (laughs) I do not recommend anyone play that game except on a joke. Um, it's basically what if a what if a top down shooter <laughs> gave you the largest hitbox humanly possible and also made every single shot an insta kill. I think the AVGN covered it like what seven years yeah. ago at this so, point. So the best example I can imagine pointing out to people who might not be as familiar with that game is the entire game is basically that part from the Ninja Turtles video game where you're underwater and swimming through the electricity. I hate the that entire game. game is that. So much. Um, but I stand by, don't play the game. Listen to the soundtrack. I did it yesterday and it was a great use of time. It's oh like my God. 15 minutes long for the whole thing <laughs> because they're like seven tracks and they're all quality. Oh my God, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, I'm trying to summarize what the show is. It's basically Andrew and myself and occasionally Ben sit down and we dig through... Uh, parts of pop culture that we might agree or disagree on. Yep, I feel like that. I feel like that the show has kind of slowly delved into let's share our favorite things with this, these people we haven't ever <laughs> recorded a podcast. But that's been fine. It's actually been working better. I mean, I saw Last Starfighter, which was a great use of time. Yeah. Got Ben to watch Star Wars. You and I burned five hours watching WrestleMania. But it's been, uh, been pretty good so far. And not to mention the twenty-hour romp or whatever that was, where we watched Harry Potter. Yep. <laughs> and this week, uh, I got you spend two hours and watch. Uh, Kevin Smith's fourth movie, Dogma. Yes, you did. And uh, what's I don't know how do we how do we start this? I guess John, what do you <laughs> you originally were kind of iffy on the film? I believe was your description. You were you were very meh. Yeah the 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 first and last time I ever watched Dogma, I was a teenager, mm-hmm. and at the time the movie just I did not care for at all. Yep, not even a little bit. Like I remember watching it and just being like. I, I don't know. I, I don't know what I was going through other than puberty. <laughs> um, I, see, the funny thing is, I've only known you at this age, so I just imagined you as like a smaller version of John, but with the same beard and hair and everything. I mean, just well, like 14 year old you is still just equally hairy, only slightly shorter with like the same level of deep voice. <laughs> I mean, that is a distinct possibility. I, I have no really idea. Funny. <laughs> <laughs> Your mom's got like photos of you with like a giant full beard when you were like 14. Oh, like, this- you're what happened to your hormones back then? <laughs> this is when he was in his ZZ Top phase. <laughs> <laughs> Just you with glasses and like a giant beard. <laughs> yeah. No. Um. So I sat down and I watched the film. Yep. And when I walked away, my honest opinion is that it may be the greatest film that Kevin Smith has ever made. See, I call this a win. <laughs> I Right there, end show. I won. <laughs> there you go, guys. Uh, finally, Andrew's on the board. I am a notch one up for me on this show. 
I still call Harry Potter a solid victory in my favor. I, 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 I may have ruined that that entire series for at least 10 different people, and I am so yeah, fine with some, that. Somewhere between a half to a full dozen people <laughs> are now looking at Harry Potter through a lens they never thought Just they like might. Just like vitriolically mad at me. <laughs> but no, so okay, what, what caused you to come to that conclusion? So um, if I may, give me one second here. Uh-huh. Okay, so first of all, the movie starts off. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of build my thoughts I into the plot totally synopsis. Is that okay. Fine. So plot synopsis plus notes, kind of like yeah. what uh, kind of like what Ben did. Yeah. That's so perfect. Um, the movie starts off with a black screen with a disclaimer, a multi-page disclaimer. Yeah. Which is super tongue in cheek and absolutely gorgeous. It reminded me a lot because I, I I had seen this movie just after I'd watched Monty Python's Holy Grail as a kid, and it was really funny for me to see a tongue in cheek disclaimer in a movie that and seeing that tongue in cheek disclaimer in the Holy Grail and then seeing this one and having a <laughs> very, not similar, but two very different tongue in cheek disclaimers for two very different purposes. Yeah. Um, so one of the first things I realized once the movie began proper was that there's some of the best crowd work I've ever seen Kevin Smith do. Cause usually in his movies you have two to maybe four people standing around having some dialogue with each other and it's good dialogue, but there's not really anything else going on around them. Right. In this movie, there is immediately like you, you have the, the two fallen angels meeting at the airport and yes. Loki is talking to a nun. Right. And you in know, a crowded airport. Yes. Mind you. Yeah. And we'll get to that. <laughs> The, the the he's talking to the nun and he's having a conversation about how ridiculous faith is and God and who is this but person and he gets her to question her faith and then the next the tail end of the scene when they're leaving the airport mm -hmm. um, she's in the background like she leaves this bar in the airport called Scooters and she's holding a pint up. And wandering around, oh the lady who works there is like trying to drag her back in and I takes the point. I never pint noticed and that. And she's like dancing around and like doing all this stuff. It's like that is like the first taste of the rest of this movie where there is stuff that's going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like the the if he, it's uh, of all of Kevin Smith's films, this one feels like a living, breathing world. Like I can't I can see that. I can't even say that about like the films that he made after that. Like uh, Clerks Two is a great example. Clerks Two, the entire time you're watching that movie, unless there's a specific, um, unless there's a specific customer that they're dealing with, the restaurant always feels like it's abandoned or empty. I mean, Clerks One felt like that too. Where yeah. if you're not in shot, there's nothing happening outside of that. I will make the argument at least with Clerks, it makes sense for a convenience store. Oh, totally. It makes complete sense because most of the time people come in, they get a pack, pack of cigarettes and then they right. leave, or but they it, go in and apparently check all the eggs and break them all and then which leave. Which is hilarious. <laughs> um, but no, it, I will give you that. Which as far as his filmography, especially if you hadn't been exposed to Dogma in a while, it's easy to forget that. Like, he is actually very good at managing crowd mm -hmm. sizes and allowing for that kind of world-building element to go on in the background because a lot of this movie has those elements. Like, for example, I've seen this movie probably seven times, mm -hmm. and I never noticed that the nun appeared later on in the airport scene. I had never heard of that before. Yeah, just that's awesome. Check it out. It's it's great. <laughs> there's there's really there's funny. some great background action going there, and it made me sad. Like because at the end of the scene when they're going to the elevator, I was hoping there'd be like a bit more. But once they because they're on one of the the people mover tram kind of um, like, moving moving walkways. Yeah, so they're on a moving walkway, and once she's out of frame, it's like oh man, I just want her to like run past the background, um, being get, chased by like a security yeah, guard get, like, or something tackled like that. Yeah, like by security on yeah. camera or something. Um, or like on camera. You know what I mean. So that was my that was my initial uh, thing that I was introduced to when I'm watching this film, and it's like, man, this this is a good movie. Like immediately, <laughs> like it just snapped. That that was like the opening thought when you saw that. Yeah, yeah fair. And at that point, they they've introduced uh, uh, Catholicism. Wow. Yep. <laughs> the initiative by by Cardinal Glick, played by uh, George, Carlin George Carlin, in all his glory. Yeah, and. Then they've also at that point I believe they've also introduced the main character of the movie, um, and given no no. So by the time they leave the airport, they've introduced Catholicism. Wow, which mm -hmm. despite being kind of a side thing in the opening, ends up becoming a major plot device. Uh, they've introduced the two angels. Mm -hmm. They've introduced and then they introduced the four characters, three of which get to the triplets. And then the person who ends right. up later being uh, John Doe Jersey, which becomes a huge important plot point. But we'll talk about that when we get there. Right. But basically, they've introduced like 
four to five major plot elements and and like the fact that loki introduces the fact that he's really into smiting and we start out bartleby as being the like no no one want like i don't want to murder anybody i just want to go home (laughs) and obviously that becomes a major plot point later but they've they've introduced character motivations main villains like everything's kind of there so as far as kevin smith films go this is the most complex plot i've ever seen him do because you essentially you have two main story threads that end up end up getting intertwined and blended together. Yep. Um, which he normally doesn't do. Like which is interesting because yeah, I would you have two different groups on their own journey and then it turns out that they're all working towards the same point. Yeah, the re- the renegade angels and the last scion yeah. and the prophets and the apostle and what have you all kind of working together under the weird machinations of an unknown force. Mm-hmm as helmed by a combination of the Metatron and, like, just other factors. And, yeah, you're right, and then those two obviously end up colliding, and that becomes the climax of the film and what have you. But, no, it makes for intri- very intricate writing, really. So I'm going to I'm gonna jump into breaking down the plot of the film. Go for it. So you have, uh, what, okay, what's the name of uh, Linda F- uh, Fiorentino's character? Bethany. Bethany. Bethany is a woman who has had a troubled life, she was married to her high school sweetheart, and uh, when he found out that she was barren, they got a divorce. Yep. And um, there's some more complex stuff that I'm not going to go into. Keep in mind, that isn't really introduced until about midway right. through the film. So she works not at... Not midway, sorry. Opening when she's having a conversation with Metron, but besides she, the point. She is a person who is Catholic, uh, and she basically is paying the church lip service because she had a crisis of faith a long time ago and doesn't really believe in God anymore or any of that kind of stuff. just there. And she works at an abortion clinic. Yep. So she has to deal with people on a daily basis who fucking hate everything she's about. Right. (laughs) Which they make note of. There are tons of protesters outside and that actually becomes like the opening, one of the opening intro gags to learning who Bethany is as a person. At the same time, you have these two fallen angels who've been on earth for a very long time Mm -hmm. and uh, they've been banished by God to Wisconsin. And for the Which might be one of the funniest damn things I've ever heard in no, my life. As a person who was born in Wisconsin, I've got a lot of love for that place, and there are worse places to be banished to. <laughs> <laughs> but I just I just love that he just decided, you know who we're gonna make an enemy of today? Wisconsinites. <laughs> you know what? Why? I don't know. It's funny. Yeah. That's why. <laughs> so um they realize or so the the fallen angels realize that this uh uh, centennial celebration for uh, the, this Catholic church in New Jersey. Which is, is where the Catholicism wild thing comes yes, in. Yes, is, is, it's being reordained or something along that. It's a rededication. Rededication, thank you. Um, and they realize through mysterious memo, like mysterious newspaper clipping that gets sent them by, who know? Just a, a newspaper shows up on Bartleby's doorstep. Um, they realize that if they walk through the arches of that church, they will immediately be forgiven of all their sins and be allowed to go to heaven. Yep. The term is plenary indulgence. Right. So they hatch a scheme to to trek over to New Jersey from Wisconsin and uh, hijinks ensue. <laughs> Basically, yeah. <laughs> then uh, at the same time, you have uh, Bethany. Bethany Sloan, yes. Yes, Bethany is uh, trying... She She's just trying to live her freaking life. Then one night, she gets interrupted by Alan Rickman... Playing the Metatron. Playing the Metatron, the voice of God. Which, to me, side note, when we were talking about this during Harry Potter, I'm so happy we watched this movie because this is the role (laughs) I most remember Alan Rickman as. Mm -hmm. When I heard that he died, I just had Metatron quotes going through my brain the entire time. Whereas everybody else was Snape. I'm like, man, the voice of God just died. So Metatron sends her on a quest to intercept the two fallen angels and hopefully convince them to not do this thing or what she doesn't know at the time. Worst case scenario, kill them. Which, yeah, um, (laughs) Alan Rickman is very coy about explaining because Mm -hmm. I think at that point, the running joke is heaven is out of goddamn ideas on what to do about this. And they just kind of, yeah, you go solve it. So the journey begins and uh, Bethany's character runs into the two prophets, which are Jay and Silent Bob. (sighs) who are Jay and Silent Bob to a T. If you don't know who these characters are, first of all, what are you doing? Watch some Kevin Smith films. Get to know the two of us a little bit better. Jay and Silent Bob are pretty damn great. So you got Jay, who is a lovable drug dealer (laughs) and just kind of a kooky guy. um, A a swear-ridden, cocky, arrogant, unintelligent motherfucker of a person played by Jason Mewes. (laughs) Yeah. 
And it, the character, his character is essentially based off of Jason Mewes back when Kevin Smith and him were in high school. Yep. <laughs> Which is phenomenal. Oh, yeah. So you've got Jay and Silent Bob. Silent Bob is silent. As played by Kevin Smith. As played by Kevin Smith, the director and writer of this film. And also clearly a very intelligent, well-rounded guy who just doesn't say anything. Unless it's, he has to. It's the classic, <laughs> uh, it's the classic gaunt mouthpiece and the quiet, hulking man who stands behind him. Right. They play that gag up a lot. So the two of them agree to accompany her to New Jersey because they were in Wisconsin for an unrelated John Hughes reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, Oh, no, no, no. They were in Illinois. Oh, sorry. Bethany, sorry. Bethany starts out in Illinois. The Angels sorry. start out in Wisconsin. They, 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 were in Sher they were looking for Sherman, Illinois, because they'd been watching a ton of John Hughes films. And, and they wanted to be kings of the town that like Breakfast Club was supposed to take place They wanted in. to be, they noticed when watching the movies, well, Jay, uh, Jay noticed there were no drug dealers in those movies. And he's like, we can live like, we can live like kings if we become drug lords in Sherman, Illinois. Unfortunately for them, Sherman, Illinois does not exist. No. <laughs> and they find that out and it's actually a really funny scene. And if you're wondering why we're pronouncing it Illinois, that is how Jay pronounces yes. it because Jay doesn't have an education and that's the <laughs> joke. Um, so they agree to accompany her under the uh, pretense that... Uh, she would sleep with them? Yeah, well, she would pay them. And then on top of that, if they were about to die, if they were five minutes away from dying, yes, then she would have sex with Jay. Yes. <laughs> and then they leave. They break down her car. Mm -hmm. And then, and then a they man falls out of the sky. <laughs> played by Chris Rock. As the 13th Apostle. Yes. So I'd like to point out, this is a movie now that has George Carlin. Yep. It has Alan Rickman. Uh, Matt Damon, Ben Affleck. Matt Damon, Ben Affleck. Although you can kind of get that with the Kevin Smith package because eh. at that point, Ben Affleck was kind of Kevin Smith's buddy. Still a big deal. Um, but so you got Ben Affleck, Matt Damon, Carlin, um, George Carlin, Alan Rickman, and now Chris Rock. Uh, Janine Garofalo, who was a big deal in the 90s, also had a bit part. <laughs> so you have all of these major actors in a Kevin Smith film. And this is when Kevin Smith was at his peak and he was trying to do something super legitimate. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're all bringing their A game. Oh, they're all like, acting their asses off. Just the scenes where you have Alan Rickman and Chris Rock bantering with each other by themselves is phenomenal. It's really <laughs> like the dialogue in this movie. And this is, I think around the apostle is when you begin to realize how well written it is, is it is witty as shit. It mm -hmm. is such a, it's such a sharp, entertaining film in how well it's written dialogue wise. Right. And uh side note, because I love this one, apparently, um, apparently what was it? Uh, Kevin Smith had a conversation with Jason Mewes when this movie started filming about the fact that he needed to be on his best behavior because Alan Rickman was around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the, 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 the actual quote that I read was, uh, Kevin Smith had scared Jason Mewes so much about memorizing his lines mm -hmm. that he didn't just memorize his lines. He memorized the entire script because, and I quote, he didn't want to piss off that Rickman dude. Which, keep in <laughs> mind, Rickman at this point, if I remember correctly, was a Shakespearean. He mm -hmm. had come from theater. Um, also, other thing about Alan Rickman in this movie, because I love this quote. Apparently, he read the draft, and the only two things he came back to with uh, Kevin Smith were, are the wings going to be real or CGI? And is the script going to be as it is right now? <laughs> that was all he asked. He was that dedicated to it where he's like, my only two questions. And I'm pretty much just saying yes, regardless of yeah. what you're answering. Alan Rickman loved this movie. Oh, yeah. It's a great role for him. Oh, it's perfect. Like, he gets to play the snarky ass mouth of God. It's phenomenal. And with Alan Rickman's voice, like... Oh, man. It's, it's some quality it's stuff. It's so good. Anyway, we've diverged. Yes. Um, so Chris Rock falls from the sky. Yes. He is an unwritten about apostle. Yes. Because he's a black man. Which, and, uh, yeah. <laughs> so you have you have Chris Rock basically doing his brand of humor in such a great way, and it fits so well. And it's so he's so freaking lovable. In Which, this. I mean, my favorite quote still might be when they when they went to uh, – wait when we – when they went to movies, which is the McDonald's of this world, right. and uh, Bethany asked, oh, so you were martyred? He's like, that's a nice way of putting it. My way of putting it is that I was bludgeoned to death by big fucking rocks. <laughs> 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 I 
it's just, it's just such a good like like he could put that in his actual bit and it would be oh, yeah. amazing because the delivery is just so on point. No, so my favorite line, if I, I'm going to backtrack a little bit here, when yeah, Ellen yeah. Rickman went as Metatron appears to Bethany in her bedroom in the middle of the night, yeah. he appears as a pillar of fire and she freaks out and pulls out her fire extinguisher and sprays him down and yeah. he's like, you use the whole can <laughs> and then uh, she he's trying to show her who he is and he shows off like that he has no junk down below any of that and she says what are you and he's like I'm pissed off is what I am <laughs> 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 or the I'm as anatomically equipped as a Ken doll yeah <laughs> like there's just there is some really great we're, we're like 40 minutes in and you and I can pull just endless quotes out of this movie so l let's keep moving let's yeah. keep moving we're don't, gonna be here all day if we don't start exactly. throwing we're, quotes we are at 21 minutes no 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 I mean we're 40 minutes into the movie okay alright so um they, they, Chris Rock shows up as one of the forgotten apostles of Jesus, who yep. also apparently is a black person. Yep. Um, and, Which he brings up. Yes. Uh, it's not important to the plot, but I just thought it was great br built into the character. That's awesome. perfect. And then after that, they, uh, there, there's a lot of discussion about basically that people in heaven just watch the living all the time. And it's a big joke. <laughs> and Chris Rock's character makes Jason Mewes, Jay, feel uncomfortable because he points out that, um, uh, he masturbates more than anyone else on the earth. And and when he does it, he's mostly thinking about guys. Right. Um, and which is, I think, one of the main times the movie shows its 90s in this. Oh, yeah. Of, like, the kind of general homophobia that was around right. at the time of, like, uh, you're gay. And it's like, ah, uh, that's kind of weird to watch in the 21st century. Right. So so gay joke to uh, drive the plot for yep. a moment. Um, um, they end up in a strip club. Yep. So that Jay can prove that he's not gay, which, whatever. Um, uh, then Selma Hayek turns out to be the stripper and also um, the a, a muse, yes. an intangible muse who is given a body and sent to Earth. But after running out of ideas for apparently she was inspiration so she could like inspire people to come up with brilliant ideas, but she couldn't keep any of them for herself. So she ran into writer's block and mm -hmm. decided to just become a stripper because apparently it's easy to get people to give money to her when she's like, you know what? <laughs> Fair enough. But uh, it makes for a pretty funny gag and Selma Hayek's great in this movie. Right. So along, along this journey so far, the, 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 uh, the, Keep in mind, we're following one right. of two main plot right. threads here, people. So along at this point right now, what's going on with Bartleby and Loki yep. is they were, on their way, and they get sidetracked because Loki is about uh, has the attention span of a gnat. Well, he also <laughs> wants to keep in mind um, Loki at this point. They don't they explain this in the movie, but we hadn't mentioned this. Loki is the the former angel of death. Right. He was the bringer of the plagues. He was the wrathful end of God's might. And right. that was a thing until he quit because after getting into an argument with Bartleby, they got into a discussion about whether um, the vengeance in the name of God is a righteous thing. Bartleby convinced Loki. Loki basically quit the job very violently. And that's why they ended up in Wisconsin is because God was like, eh, I don't know if I like having these assholes around and threw them to earth. And that's the deal. And Loki is convinced that a way to get into God's good graces before they walk into the arch is to smite the sinful. Right. And in this case, the smiting of the sinful are uh, idolers, um, which are people... Idolaters. Oh, sorry. Uh, idolaters. In this case, being the corporate staff of movies, the golden calf. Which... <laughs> holy shit, there is so much to unpack there, right. but it's amazing that they decided to come up with a golden calf as essentially their their world's version of, of Walt Disney and Mickey Mouse. Now, something I want to touch on here is that essentially Loki and Bartleby are kind of an embodiment of people who try to press their religion on people in general. Yeah, um, to a certain extent. And it's great because the flip side are the people who are actually on a mission from heaven. They're pretty laid back about everything. Yeah. Like, they're even eating at movies. Like, <laughs> <laughs> And you got two stoners with them the entire time. Oh, yeah. Everything. It's chill. And it's put best by, by I believe it was Chris Rock, where it's like that um, fate or belief is one of the things that gets in the way. It's, it's good to have ideas. 
It's yeah. bad to have beliefs. Beliefs, <laughs> and that that's an entirely different quote. Anyway, so anyway. They, Loki executes the um, corporate heads of m- movie mm-hmm. after the movie corporation after Bartleby as a watcher, which was his position before um, before God sent them out. Which means he can look through people and understand everything about them. Um, basically, tells everybody of the corporate board all of the horrible things that they've all done to each other, and like a minute amount, but like the worst thing they've right. done. Which holy crap, that's a long list. No, that 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 boardroom is full of skeletons just in general. Oh, like. <laughs> and then Loki executes them all and basically they spend the entire movie just kind of meandering their way across the United States, occasionally murdering people for sinful things and because then, Loki had bought a desert eagle at the very beginning of yeah. this. Well, and so along this way, they are uh they they kind of they don't really I don't know if it's explained that he's the person who sent them the letter, but it turns out that the person who's been stirring the pot the entire time is another fallen angel. A demon by the name of Azrael. Yeah, Azrael played by... Uh, Jason Lee. Jason Lee. Which, by the way, that's plot thread number three. Plot this is how three. complex of a movie this is. Plot, the number th- plot thread number three is Jason Lee trying to basically stir shit to cause the end of the universe. It's implied that he sent the newspaper Mm -hmm. to the angels. It's very clear that he sent numerous demonic agents to try and kill the last scion. Right. And he's working out of some random person's house in God knows where America. Right. Um, and it's pretty great. He's, he's actually, Jason Lee's really good in this movie. He is mugging his ass off as oh, the I mean, smuggest bastard on the face of the planet. He's doing what he does best. Oh, he's great. White suit and all demon oh, horns. Man. Oh, he's fantastic. But he, he shows up to them as sort of a friend, tells them to lay low. Um, because he needs them to complete their objective. But he doesn't tell them that. He right. just tells them that everybody is looking for them everywhere and to tone down their high-profile behavior because, obviously, executing people is what will get you noticed in this world. Right. And they were about to unveil their wings, and he's like, no, 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 calm down. Both heaven and hell are looking for you, and the second they find you, you're gone. Right, and he even points out that they've got the last Zion after them. Which is a big deal because right. this is actually a very huge turning point for both Bartleby and Loki where Loki realizes how big all of this is and Bartleby gets really pissed. Right. So there's sort of there's sort of a a, a bit shift there where it's like there is. their roles flop where it starts off with Loki wanting to go home really bad yep. and Bartleby just sort of like yeah, we should go home. And now things have kind of switched to Bartleby being like incensed and he's like fuck humanity, fuck all these people. I want to go home. What right do they have, you know... To keep me out of heaven. Right. Whereas Loki becomes a lot more calm of, like, maybe we should think about the consequences of what's happening here. There's even a moment where Loki's like, let's go home. Let's go home. Let's go home right now. Or let's go back to Wisconsin. Let's forget about this whole journey. But that happens later because we get to the point where actually this is where the climax happens and our two plot threads collide Mm -hmm. and brute force and there's a scene on a train where all our characters kind of meet each other and accidentally reveal too much about what they're doing both sides do Mm -hmm. and realize oh fuck what just happened right so bethany and uh bartleby just start conversing on the train that they both happen to be on both get drunk both of them get drunk she's flirting with him yeah he's they both talk about yeah. how screwed they were by former lovers, which is implied from Bethany's case. And like Bartleby talks in a way mm-hmm. that he's kind of disguising the fact that he's talking about God to make it sound like he's talking about a lover, but he's actually very clearly talking about God. So Chris then, Rock walks in, realizes what the shit's going on. Fight scene ensues. Um, there's an Indiana Jones reference <laughs> <laughs> after Silent Bob chucks both angels off of the train. Right. <laughs> which honestly is kind of timely considering. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, considering the the fallout that's going on with uh um, with all airline structures right now. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> no ticket. <laughs> that was brilliant. But um, yeah, and then the plots diverge again after everything kind of crashes into each other, and every single plot thread flops so, big time. So after they get off the the train, because they decide to leave the train too, because in the uh, the We're, influenced by Chris Rock, it's like yeah. let's let's keep them guessing. We don't yep. want them to know where we are. If your enemies know where you are, don't be there. Right. I believe is his quote. Yes. So they end up camping out kind of in the woods. Um, and Bethany is having a crisis of faith and is just like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. Cause she suddenly realizes that 
she is going to have to kill these angels. She's like, how do I kill an angel? And she also is told at that point, because at that point, no one tells her this, that she is the great, 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 great grandniece of Jesus Christ. And she right. just loses it. And it's it's this brilliant moment where she freaks out and is yelling at the sky and Alan Rickman just appears floating in the lake that she's been, she just found herself in. I love that scene. That scene's great. I absolutely adore that scene where like Rickman is the voice of God is comforting her and is like, yeah, I had to tell Christ the same thing. It's unfair. I wasn't happy about it. Yeah. He said something like, how do you tell a 12 year old child that they are the son of God and that (laughs) they're going to, they're going to die. They're going to live and die by the hands of the people that they have come to care about and redeem. Right. It's unfair to tell that to a child. It, it, that moment sent, and even now sends like shivers down my back. Like it's brilliant. It's so brilliantly delivered. It's well-written. It's such a great scene. Yeah. Meanwhile, Meanwhile, Bartleby is having his own crisis of faith, but this one, he straight loses his mind and realizes exactly what the angel-human dynamic is, freaks out and decides, you know what, let's just burn everything. I don't even care anymore. And the quote from Loki is, I've heard a rant like this before. Right. You sound like you sound like the morning star. You sound exactly like Lucifer, man. <laughs> and, oh, God, it's a oh, great, it's so great, it's a greatly written scene. So to fast track a little bit, uh, Bethany, uh, she comes to the conclusion that she's fine with this. Yeah, she 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 gets right back on track. Um, there is a a moment where they're like, "All oh, right, we need to reconvene, and then we're going to head out to uh, mm-hmm. we're going to head out to New Jersey and try and convince this cardinal that yep. we he needs to postpone the celebration and all that." So that these angels can't go in. It's like, all right, well, fuck, <laughs> let's try and do that. Which, of course, doesn't work. And no. they find themselves in a seedy bar right. where they're, they're grabbing a few beers. And then Azrael shows up and is like, oh, by the way, I've been the one who is running the show. And now I just need to distract you for long enough for my two idiot pawns to move everything into checkmate and end existence and they ask him why, and he's uh, it, uh, and that's also Jason Lee's crowning moment, I would right. say, is, human, have you ever been to the pit (laughs) I'll take non-existence over going back to hell. And if everybody has to go down with me, so be it, which holy shit, that's a good quote. Oh yeah. It's, it's also a nice bow on why he specifically picked a house for his domain to run things from that is completely air conditioned. It's like, of course, because hell is hot, right? Which is perfect (laughs) because he's been dealing with it for like what? Four, what like four billion years something or something like ludicrous it, like that? There, there's a great moment where at the at, towards the beginning when he gets the house and he just turns on he cranks the AC. He's like, ah, no central air. No, <laughs> no, oh, it's no sin, no rapture greater than central air. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so he's holding it back and he turns on the TV and uh, Bartleby show, and Loki have lost their goddamn. Bartleby minds. and Loki have shown up at the de- rededication ceremony. And, th- of course, Bartleby is doing his sort of... He's he's become theatric at this point. Oh, yeah. And he's, he's flipped, lost his he's mind. He's flipped with Loki, which is hilarious because he was making fun of Loki for being too into the theatrics when they began this journey. Long story short, he breaks a police officer's neck and causes people to disperse. And then... Uh, all sorts of shenanigans ensue that involve them basically murdering the entire crowd of people in front of this church. And just picking people up off the streets of Jersey and just chucking them into wherever. So meanwhile, Selma Hayek, uh, uh, Chris Rock, and, uh, you know... Everybody. Everybody. All the good guys. They're all at this bar being held by Azrael. Managed to kill him using the enchanted driver of Cardinal Glick. Right, because uh, they... Jay and Silent Bob stole Cardinal Glick's Uh, driver while he wasn't paying attention and the reason that this could kill the demon played by uh, Azrael played by Jason Lee is that of course a cardinal like Glick would bless his own club to give him some sort of advantage to give himself a better (laughs) golf game and then they beat Azrael with it they get one swing in and because it's technically a holy instrument instantly kills him right they drown the three triplets in holy water as consecrated by Bethany because she's the last scion which means she has the holy touch and run the run the fuck out to go try and stop these guys and at this point Bartleby has given up on any sense of subtlety and is just murdering people en masse now this is where the climax of the movie begins yep 
They show up at the church, and it is a slaughter. Oh, the, and the worst. Loki is wandering around. He's cut his wings off, and he's drunk. And because <laughs> angels can't be drunk, but humans can. Right. And he cut his wings off to make himself mortal. Yep. Um, that way, once they, the way that this works is they become mortal, which, we'll get back to this. Uh, they, they become mortal, and then they can walk through the arch, have their sins forgiven, and then go to heaven. Yep. The idea was that they were trying to murder as many people as possible before they do that, so that the cops show up, so that when they leave the church, the cops Instantly execute them. shoot them on sight. Yes. And then because that's he can't not die. suicide. Because he can't die with a mortal sin. Mortal sin is su- uh, Suicide is a mortal sin. Right. So meanwhile, Bartleby's flying around just picking up random ass people from around and carrying them up in the air and dropping them. Yep. <laughs> and they show up and they're like, what the fuck do we do? Well, J- Jay is like, shoot the motherfuckers. And he's like, no, don't shoot them. Don't shoot them. Like if they die, <laughs> they'll blink out existence. You can't do that. Right. So they're trying to figure out what to do. And then uh, Loki loses it. Mm-hmm. Loki just starts shouting at Bartleby that he's an insane person and that he just wanted to go home and that this has gone too far and he tries to kill Bartleby, but he's too goddamn drunk and uh, Bartleby just stabs him and then Matt Damon dies and the assumption is that he goes to hell because existence doesn't blink out and after a lot of arguing on how to solve the problem, they realize that the John Doe Jersey character from the very beginning of the film is potentially where the Almighty has been trapped in as a mortal vessel. So we kind of glossed over this earlier in the film. It is mentioned that during during the previous scene, we realized that Heaven's been kind of freaking out because they don't know where God is. Because it turns out God is a skee-ball fanatic. And will occasionally just take the form of a human being. And go down to Earth and play skee-ball for a while. The problem is with mortal bodies that if they if they die, God will just return right to heaven. Right. The problem is that Osriel figured out a way to keep them in a stasis, essentially, by beating a man near to death. And then the hospital, being a Catholic hospital, kept him on life support because they were against the idea of euthanasia. So God is essentially trapped in a vegetable of a body because they can't escape because they can't die. And nobody claims anything that with this person because no one knows who they are. So Bethany, the last Zion kind of puts the pieces together, finds out that the hospital that God is being kept in is basically across the street. St. Michael's hospital. Right. She runs in there and pulls the plug on the old man in a coma in the hospital and light shoots forth and her stomach, uterus, whatever starts bleeding out. And she is a martyr. She And, dies. and God shoots up into the heavens and Bartleby right runs Bartle- for the entrance after having his wings shot off by Jason Mewes in a very amusing fashion, which, yes. hey, big bird, count the shells. Let's, let's play the counting game. Count the, shell, <laughs> count the shells, you suck a duck. Might be one of my favorite things ever. Um, so Bartleby walks towards the doorway of the church, opens it up, light spews forth, and there is Alanis Morissette as playing God. God, <laughs> with Alan Rickman still working as the voice with... Another one of my favorite quotes. Oh, Bartleby. Was Wisconsin really that bad? (laughs) So this is the moment where you have God expertly played by Alanis Morissette. She did phenomenal. She did a great job. She can't speak because... They explained at the very beginning of the movie that mortals cannot withstand the true voice of God. Right. And they went through six atoms before they figured out that out. (laughs) And so when God speaks, the simple thought of it is too impossible to comprehend for human ears. And if you're mortal, your head explodes. So Bartleby, Bartleby apologizes for everything. He breaks down and he's in tears and, and God forgives him. Yep. And then she unleashes the power of her voice and his head head explodes. Which is, man, to quote Red Letter Media, head explosions don't show up in enough movies nowadays. A head explosion, you don't want to overdo it, but when it happens, Uh, it's special. So good. Just mm. Anyway, his head blows (laughs) up, and I mean, everything kind of ties together. The immortals leave. Turns out Bethany is dead. Silent Mm -hmm. Bob brings her back. And God revives her in full because omnipotent, whatever. And not only revives her, but also uh, makes her pregnant, which is another plot point we kind of glossed over. The reason, I, I mentioned that- The reason Bethany lost faith in God, the crisis of faith, was that because she was barren, her husband left her because he 
she couldn't have his kids and that was a breaking point for him and he left her and then she couldn't have kids of her own and it was a big deal because that was her breaking point of a crisis of faith of why he she lost faith in God was no righteous God would have let this happen to me. So at this point, Alanis Morissette kind of changes into like an awesome like silver tuxedo jacket and tutu combo with fun shorts underneath. Which, and she's running around being basically a grown-up child and it is wonderful. Which, by the way, is really funny because she was wearing like a very Grecian tunic beforehand. Mm-hmm. But after having head blood fall on his jacket, Alan Rickman is just like, dear God, not again. And wipes it off using her using her like robe, <laughs> then realizes exactly what he just did and is just like, ah, d- ah, damn it, sorry. <laughs> and so she's wandering around playing with flowers and doing handstands and stuff like that. And fixes all the carnage from before with a head nod, mm-hmm. revives Bethany, and then Bethany tries to get out the question of what is the meaning to life. To which God, played by Alanis Morissette, and I can't stop saying that, yep. um, looks at her, gives her a knowing look, and then just reaches her hand out, squishes her nose, and goes, <laughs> and then leaves. <laughs> and then leaves. <laughs> and then the immortals all leave. Um, Selma Hayek, the apostle, Alan Rickman, all peace out. They have their final moments. And the, the movie just cools off. Like, and it, it ends with Jason Mewes saying something lewd about God, and it was great. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah. Yeah, just... Guy just fades out. Jason Mew, Jay and Silent Bob and Bethany just sitting on the steps of a church, just... That was it. That was quite the freaking adventure. And then the uh, the credits might be some of my favorite because you get to see everybody midline just right. failing. The bloopers in this movie are fantastic. So <laughs> this was a fun movie. This was a really really fun movie. I'm and glad you liked it. If, I'm, yeah. If anyone out there has not seen this movie, you should really watch it. Like, man, just I we we were supposed to talk about like positives and negatives, and the negative stuff that I have to say about this movie. It's not really that important. Like some some of the the comedy's a little outdated. Like yeah, the homophobia thing, or yeah. just like a, I don't know. There are moments that seem a little bit off kilter. Right, and most of that's like it's just a product of its era. It's also <laughs> a lot of like the weird collision of the lewd humor of Jay and Silent Bob mm-hmm. with a very very like satirical film about religion, which it, it has its moments where it really fits, but they're really off putting every now and then to be like, why the hell are these guys here? <laughs> okay. Uh, I just want to take a moment to also bring up my other favorite line from the movie, mm. um, which is Jay losing his fucking mind when she's trying to uh, proposition them to take her on the journey. And he says, and I quote, I feel like Han Solo, you're Chewie, and she's Ben Kenobi, and we're in that fucked up bar. I, I You know, really funny thing? Every <laughs> single transition in this movie is a wipe. <laughs> <laughs> and that was actually done purposely. Oh my God, because Kevin Smith that. did that line and was he like, would. it's his Star Wars, essentially. <laughs> it's him doing the same idea of like, what if I did a movie about like an intangible quest and then he made Dogma? I mean, in, in kind of a way, like the, the plot beats of it kind of... You know, they, yeah. they, they're, it's like poetry. It rhymes. Well, with, the, with the secondary plot threads of the angels, I think it gains a lot more than, like, the original Star Wars. Then I mean, you don't see, like, the growth and progress of, like, Darth Vader, but you definitely see the growth and progress of the angels. But what would you say are your major criticisms of this movie, if you really even have any? Um, I thought the, the triplet skater kids were kind of weak. Yeah, they were really underutilized. Uh, I felt like the... Honestly, I in certain respects, and don't get me wrong, I still enjoyed the the, the movie and the character and all that. Mm-hmm. Linda Fiorentino is like probably the weakest actor in this movie. I'd agree. And it, around this time, she was also in the Men in Black. Um, yeah. And I feel she was I, L in Men in Black. I've always felt the same way about her. Every time we're serious, she's got this really flat delivery, and she kind of talks a little quick, and she kind of yeah. mutters through her lines, and it's like, oh my god, just. Show some emotion, emote. With with <laughs> Bethany, it makes sense where it's like Bethany is a very detached person where it, like it fits. It and the only fits, moment she it shows, it still feels lazy. I actually, I agree. I would definitely say it it fits Bethany's character. I just wish there was a different actress. But the the moment where she does really emote, and I think she really shines as an actress is her very much, like, primal freakout after they get off the train when she's yelling at just the sky. That is the one moment where I'm like, yeah, you're good no, at this. Wait, wait, in those extremes, she's great. It's just it's very blasé for a good chunk of the film. Right, and it, it's something that I also... It might also just be a relic of the era in which this film was made. Probably. Um, also, uh, it's something that's not really a criticism so much as it is an interesting thing and I want to come back to. Mm-hmm. 
this was made. This movie was made in uh, 1999, yes, it was. or released in 1999. Yeah, um, probably in 97. So this was before 9/11 happened, which means at the beginning when they're at the airport. You have an airport where you have people waiting for other people to get off a which, plane. Yeah, it's one of those things that's such a <laughs> relic of the era, which is kind of bizarre, really. Ba- back when airports, th- like, this was a thing. Before that happened in 2001, uh, airports were con- basically little cities, little condensed cities. Yeah. You go in there and you have people from all over the world either waiting to pick someone up or drop someone off. You're watching airplanes. Yeah. There's all sorts of shops and restaurants. And there still are, but... Man, it is not the same. Well, security checks were at the gate, and that was the huge difference. You would go through a scanning before you went on the plane, because, I mean, Mm -hmm. obviously they had had incidents before that of terrorist things and what have you and hijackings. But you would go through... You wouldn't go through a metal detector before you even got to those shops. You would go through the metal detector right before you went on that plane. I used to go to the... When I was a little kid, I used to go to the airport with my mom and my dad because my mom would be leaving for some conference for her work. Whatever, yeah. And we would go there early in the morning and just sit at the gate with my mom. She'd get on her plane. We'd sit there and watch the plane take off and wave at the plane, all that stuff. That doesn't happen anymore. No. And that's another thing of like a relic of its time where Bartleby Bartleby at the beginning is talking about um, loving these like, uh, was it loving these sappy moments where everybody just gets off the plane and forgets all the worry and the hate and all of that just to be like, hi, it's nice to see you again. And he's, I don't know. It's a it's a good moment in the film, but it definitely it feels dated. So now that this is this is an agree to disagree episode. Yeah. So I of course need to pull out some numbers real quick. Sure. Um, this movie had a ten million dollar budget. Yes. First of all, that means that a lot of the actors in there were definitely like working for scale or something. Like oh, 10 yeah. Ten million totally. is not a lot of money. Um, this movie grossed worldwide box office thirty million dollars. So it made back. Double what it costs to make, which is very good for a movie of like as controversial as it was during the time. That's really solid number wise. So this movie held the uh, record for third highest grossing opening weekend, and it was behind The Bone Collector, which is a movie I've never seen and I don't care about. I've never even heard of. And the other movie was Pokemon, the first movie. Oh my god! <laughs> damn it. And you know what's really frustrating to me? Eight-year-old me saw Pokemon, the f- Pokemon, <laughs> the first movie in theaters, because obviously eight-year-old me would not have loved this film. But that's that's really hilarious to me that out of the two films I could have potentially seen that day, <laughs> Dogma is more meaningful to me, and I, I didn't see it. I just love the fact that this movie came out the same year as the first Pokemon movie in the U.S. God, right? And also, it it just trailed behind it, third place. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> and you know what? Hmm. The Pokemon movie is probably more well remembered by people who are my age because my generation is the worst. <laughs> hey, God damn millennials. Yeah, we suck. Um, anyway, <laughs> so, so it sounds, I mean, it sounds like you enjoyed a good, pretty much most of the movie from the sound of it. I mean, I did. I sat down and I tried to go into it with an opening mo- open mind. And, like, it, it's not difficult. I love Kevin Smith films in general. Yeah. Um, they're always a lot of fun. Even his weaker movies, I enjoy it. I, I like Tusk. Like, <laughs> wow, you're <laughs> one of, I think, probably according to Rotten Tomatoes, 30% of the people who saw it. <laughs> um, and, like, I just enjoy his films. It, he makes a type of film that you don't see very much anymore, which is basically, hey, you know what? We got a camera. We got a, we got a budget. Let's just make a movie. Yeah. Like... It doesn't have to be the world's largest film. It doesn't. He's not necessarily trying to do something artistic. No, he's not. He's, try, he's not trying to break the box office. He's not doing it for like, oh, I gotta write something meaningful. It's just he just wants to get some people together and make a movie. Yeah, and that's <laughs> rare, and that's really rare nowadays. And I, I miss that like talent to Hollywood that I think, yeah. admittedly, kind of got ruined by the attempts at blockbuster movies that happened. That's become such a craze recently, where everything needs to be remade or everything needs to be making like. 20 times its budget. Right. But like Kevin Smith movies are a, you give them a shoestring budget and it's just sort of like, yeah, I'm going to make a movie. Yeah. It's and a, it's a good thing. Maybe it's not good. Maybe it's not. I mean, like, yeah. T- I mean, the people who saw Tusk are probably like, this probably wasn't that great, but at least there's someone out there who's trying to just make entertaining films. It, it's a very old Hollywood kind of thought where it's like, you know what? Uh, we've got a, we've got a budget. We've got a script. Let's make a thing. We'll put it out. People will watch it. And then we make the next thing. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not even like, oh, we're going to make a sequel to it as in no. we're going to make the next thing. No, it's just 
let's just make a completely unrelated movie off of the profits we make from this one. Why yeah, not? Sure. Um, and I love that about this, about his films in general. Yeah. And I, I don't know, I guess final thoughts. I mean, I adored this movie before. I still do. <laughs> I think it's the eighth time I've watched it. I can probably rant off most of this script. I've got a thousand lit, a thousand quotes that I adore from this film. Um, ah, damn it. I just love this movie, man. You know, I feel like I'm probably going to go back and watch it again just for the hell of it. Like it was a good, it was a good yeah. enough movie that it's like, you know what? I don't feel like I've given this movie as much attention as I've given all of the other films that Kevin Smith has made. Yeah. Um, I'm going to watch it again. Like it, maybe not tomorrow, but yeah. soon. <laughs> it's, it's my favorite movie for, I used to do movie nights with friends of mine and I, I was known for being that guy who'd bring in like, pretentious random nonsense or like Tarantino movies or like I force people to watch like the seventh seal and stuff like that. But dogma is my favorite movie to introduce the way I watch movies to people where I'm like, yeah, I have my pretentious moments and I pay attention to way too my nude stuff, but you know what? Let's just watch a, a damn funny film that also happens to have a lot of meaning and weight behind it. Yeah. But it's also a movie that just like, who cares? It's funny. <laughs> and that's kind of what dogma is. It's a movie with meaning and weight and a whole lot of really good thought. Yeah, but it's damn funny, and that's what works. So, to wrap up, yep. Since we're on the topic of uh, small movies made by people who just want to make films, and it doesn't need to make make or break the bank, let's talk about the Marvel Cinematic Universe you, next you time. You mean the polar opposite <laughs> of what we just talked about? Actually, you know what? There is a tie here that we could have used, which is that the View Askew Universe is one of the few... The, the View Askew Universe is one of the one of the original attempts at, attempts at making a shared universe sort of thought, and obviously the immediate connection is the Marvel Cinematic Universe being the most successful form of that. So next episode, John and I are going to sit down. We're going to do a, we're going to do kind of a one shot next yes. time. We're going to, we're going to do a one parter of just John and I share our thoughts about the Marvel movies and the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe, especially since Guardians 2 is coming out. Yes. We thought that'd be a fitting topic for a <laughs> one shot episode. Yeah. We're going to, we're going to do some gushing. We're going to do some criticisms. Yep. We're just going to talk about, we're, gonna, we're just going to shoot the shit about Marvel and its superheroes. Yeah. Which is, to me, a great use of time. Yeah. We'll see you next time, folks. Bye, everybody.